Well, last year, during the battle for Mosul, I was in northern Iraq. We were traveling into a town um, just outside the city of Mosul called Bishika. And we drove in in a very fast, uh, high-speed convoy because just a few miles away, there were ongoing combat operations against ISIS. We were close enough that we could actually see the activity in the western part of the city by the smoke rising, and uh, you could even smell the smoke inside the vehicles. So we only slowed down when we finally arrived into the city and met up with a group of soldiers that had been waiting for us. You see, this town, just one week earlier, had been entirely controlled by ISIS militants. They'd lived here for about two years, using the homes. They dug tunnels underneath the ground to move people and weapons so that they wouldn't be detected from the air. They were known to force families that didn't run away in time to stay, uh, using innocent civilians as human shields, a tactic they knew would slow the advances of coalition forces. So even though the militants were now gone, the danger now was in opening a door that had been rigged with explosives or stepping on a hidden IED. So we were taken to a specific home that had been cleared um, for us to visit. We were told that this house used to belong to a family. And um, I said home, but other than saying it looked like a slaughterhouse out of a horror movie, it, it, I didn't recognize anything that made it look like a home. I mean, the ground was covered in dirt, mounds of dirt and garbage and casings. The walls were riddled with bullet holes. And um, I mean, this, you could, it felt toxic. You could even taste the uh, what was it, thermite and the decay. Um, we walked through, I think, a living room. It was filled with vats of chemicals and wires and various uniforms and tools. We were told that they were teaching fighters terror tactics here. Couldn't imagine this was um, someone's living room, let alone this was someone's home. But then we walked into a child's bedroom, and it was there that I finally could feel the echoes of a family's life before all of this. There were toys and stuffed animals on the ground. There were bright colors peeking through the carnage of garbage. And on the walls was something else. Um, in this child's room, in thick black ink, there were writings and inscriptions on the walls. I think some were names or instructions. What it was, it was vile proof that the worst of humanity had come and destroyed lives, destroyed childhoods, and destroyed futures. With all my hope and optimism and understanding of how the international community could get involved, I still can't imagine how anyone could go back and call that um, home. Maybe you'll understand this feeling that I'm trying to convey, you know, this kind of nauseating feeling that you have when you feel helpless in the face of despair. Many of you I know have been in the field, downrange, in war zones, you've seen it firsthand. Or you know it intimately by watching from above. We see gut-wrenching feeds of suffering people caught in wars that they never asked for. In the news, they become data and statistics. They become these huge numbers. They're actually diminished to huge numbers that get lost in these complicated issues. And I used to get upset at, oh my gosh, people are using all these statistics to describe people. But I realize that the numbers are still important because these issues, like refugees, they're not just issues. They're people, real people, like you and me. And if you'd allow me, um, I'd like to introduce you to one of these numbers. Out of over 2,991,000 refugees in just Iraq alone, she is one. And she's from this town that we just visited. 
Right now, right now in a refugee camp, there is a little girl, and her name is Mia. And Mia is 11 years old. And she remembers vividly when ISIS fighters came and brutally took over the town, enslaving many of the women and the children. Um, when the fighters started going in and taking over homes, they were forcing families out at gunpoint, and if anyone refused or resisted, they were killed on the spot. When the fighters started approaching towards Mia's home, her dad, Mia's father, he knew that they couldn't all outrun them. So he placed her and her two sisters into an uncle's car and sent them to flee. Mia's father was brutally executed, along with hundreds of other men in the town. He would never know that his quick decision saved the lives of those that he loved the most. But what will Mia's worldview be? What kind of chances does she have now? Now she's going to be stuck in a cycle of violence and vulnerability. Unfortunately, the story is not that unique because it's repeated. It's repeated. It's repeated in places like Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, Syria. And I was tired of going to these places, tired of going to places where it is too late. In conflict zones, it's almost always too late. Um, programs are unsustainable because when the security situation deteriorates, Organizations are forced to abandon projects or programs uh, where not only are all of the gains lost at that point, sometimes people are left even more vulnerable than before we intervened. And it's not some malign intent of organizations. Um, without getting into the weeds of development issues, our sector is structured to be reactive. We stand by, on call, fundraise until something bad happens, and then we can operate, but to react to what's happened. Um, and I want to be clear that what I'm talking about today is not disaster response. We talked about that yesterday, but there is a difference between direct relief, disaster response, and initiatives that exist to address chronic crises, especially now when we know that we have better tools and we know better, yet oftentimes the two types of operations are still run the same way. And organizations really on the ground are the first to say, we know that there's a better way. We can't change this whole system unless we just blow it up and start over. But we know that there's a better way and a more informed way to get ahead of these issues. And so this is where your world came into mine. Working with various data scientists and economists and uh, for-profit data companies that gave us access to their platforms, we were able to see that geospatial imagery uh, with multiple layers of georeference data could help us understand what the root contributors were in these areas of instability. It also started to give us patterns that we could look at, patterns that would help us identify and anticipate where are these next hotspots that we can start paying attention to. Yes, the world is paying attention to places that have already blown up. Where should we be mitigating, building resiliency, starting to plan? And okay, so it was also then that I saw the power of visualization tools, that this is what could help convey the humanitarian imperative for proactive development in certain areas because we have to go to the funding agencies or the donors or whoever is basically, because the aid ends up being a donor agenda, the visualization was so powerful. It also helped us put humanitarian aid in the context of national security. So we could actually show the um, imperative, the national security imperative for proactive development in specific areas. Humanitarian crises have national security consequences. We know that ungoverned spaces in fragile states are and will be exploited by extremist groups and transnational criminals in order to further their agenda. These bad actors, when they, when they see instability, they see opportunity. 
They swarm to these places with power and security vacuums, and they exploit the vulnerabilities. They uh, gain territory to legitimize their cause. They use people and places for human, drugs, weapons trafficking. They provide governance, their idea of governance. They even provide jobs. These crises can become protracted, and they become geopolitical and security liabilities. So some people say, OK, you're working in these areas where there are wars and conflicts. You, we, we have to do something. At least we're doing something. And the problem with that is we know that sometimes the best of intentions have negative unintended consequences. I have, um, I've seen an example, actually, of one. One of my last trips to Iraq, I have this video that I took with my phone. And it's online now. And in this video, I'm showing you a tunnel that ISIS militants had dug. And these tunnels lead to sniper positions. And so I'm showing you how they had dug the tunnels, where they slept, where they were storing ammunition. Um, uh, they rigged these tunnels with electricity to put in fans. It was pretty intricate. And then I show you where the food was being stored. And it is unbelievable because there are logos on these boxes that read World Food Program. We're literally feeding the enemy to continue fighting. The intention was to reach vulnerable populations. But manipulated and, re and redirected aid is very real when you're going into places where non-states are controlling territory. I would call that a too late situation. I've seen medicine and food meant to go to starving, de desperate refugees actually relabeled with signs that read, ISIS Department for Relief. Oh, well, we just help them win people, legitimize their cause, win territory. We go into newly liberated towns, and you see these boxes that they came in saying, we're going to provide better governance and food and jobs for you. Look, you've been abandoned by the rest of the world. For humanitarians, it's almost like they've become our biggest competitor. So how do we win? How do we beat the competition? The answer is that we must be proactive. We must preemptively invest in global stability by identifying where these next hotspots are, understand the interconnectedness of these issues, and coordinate efforts to mitigate, to prevent, and to build resiliency with people. Now, people say, well, how do you measure resiliency? How do you measure empowering people? Um, you know, and the definitions are so different. But I believe that to truly empower people, to help people help themselves, we must give a hand up, not handouts. Otherwise, we're just putting Band-Aids on these issues while the wound festers. It's like uh, addressing the symptoms and never attacking the underlying disease. Proactive, uh, reactive, sorry, reactive programming is rarely empowering because it's actually very output-based when it's regarding to numbers. It's how many bags of rice you're giving out. How many wells are you digging? How many higher and higher numbers of people are you reaching in shorter amounts of time? And maybe you'll agree with me on this. Uh, something that I have a problem with, this kind of reactive programming, is that it feeds this narrative. It feeds this narrative of the other, those people. It paints those people as separate from us, as helpless victims of their circumstances, stripped of dignity, and defined by vulnerability and deficiency. How are these programs empowering people if the message to them and to the world is that they must be saved? They are not capable. They can't even act or speak for themselves because someone else, we must be a voice for them. Sometimes I think we're too busy feeding rice to hungry mouths to listen to what these mouths are saying. How many times have you seen a photo of a father clinging to his son's corpse, or of a starving child staring back at you with pleading eyes. The message in that picture is, 
I'm the victim, you are the hero. Act now before it's too late. No. How about act now to prevent another million of these senseless tragedies? We must do better than what we have done before. And we can't connect just for connecting's sake. We have to connect in a way that acknowledges our shared humanity and builds resiliency so that not only can people be their own first responders, they become strong partners. I think this is a powerful way to show leading leadership in the world. Because as a nation, when we show not just our power, but also our compassion, we reveal the, the, the nature of our character to the world. And we need your help. The profile of a humanitarian is changing. Just as the profile of an intelligence officer of today has evolved, maybe an intel officer of today needs to know, I don't know, coding, hacking? No? A humanitarian of today should expect that data crunching and analysis, that they should be standard skill sets. They should see the value in it, okay? So hopefully maybe someone here can create a program to teach analytic tradecraft to humanitarians so that we can all speak a, a common language. Then we can leverage each other's strengths. The benefits of a symbiotic approach like this goes far beyond what data science can do alone. Because for this to really work, we need data scientists to intermix with social scientists and those that understand the human terrain. Because human geography integration will be crucial in humanitarian organizations willingly adopting these tools. And when they do, it'll change everything. Because organizations can now create programs that actually address needs on the ground instead of maybe landing on the ground with a solution in a box. They can coordinate efforts with each other. They can iterate in real time based on changing circumstances. They could, instead of measuring success by how much numbers, numbers going out, out, how many people, it's understanding resiliency, maybe a resiliency rating. You know, it's re becoming redundant so that people are able to scale and sustain programs on their own. So this is what makes me, as a humanitarian, excited about these tools. But the power in all of these tools, and this is not just the humanitarian sector, the power in all of these data science tools come through partnerships, through cross-sector, cross-discipline, collaboration, and coordination. And I want to give you an example of what that looks like today. And actually, this is a chance for me to thank the, at the NGA for pushing, for leading the sense of urgency for partnerships and for open, unclassified data sharing. Because right now, in South Korea, a group of humanitarians is using geospatial intelligence to collect evidence of mass atrocities perpetrated by the North Korean regime in North Korea. The NGA is providing raw data and expert analysis, and this is enabling the mapping of execution sites uh, mass graves, prison camps, labor camps, places where there may have already been clearing operations. And since we can't waltz into North Korea and check it out ourselves yet, we rely heavily on the imagery and on defector testimony. So to enhance confidence in these sites, we need to overlay other data sets. An example could be we know that different chemical compositions occur in the soil in certain body sites. We know that patterns to foliage changes. So for the sake of brevity, it's looking at historical imagery of other known mass grave sites and understanding the patterns. Advancements in LIDAR and remote sensing and access to finer spatial imagery will only, it will only just help substantiate these locations and timelines. I think this is a powerful example of preemptively investing. So that one day when there, however we get there, one day when there can be transitional justice, this repository, this rich repository of information can be used to advance stabilization for the critical peace and reconciliation process, which hopefully negates you know, these 
whatever it's called in the future, North Korea, from becoming the next failed state. So if I were to just use my imagination and hope for, if I could create anything, and if I were a data scientist, I would imagine, you know what a kaleidoscope is, right? Like a sight picture, there's a pattern, you change one thing and everything changes. A kaleidoscopic dashboard that's like wargaming for humanitarians. You throw in a time slider, make it interactive. Organizations can then introduce their interventions into a specific scenario, immediately see the potential second, third order effects, and it won't tell them what to do, but it'll give them, it'll give us a chance to ask better questions and avoid unintended consequences. If you could help our sector become more data-driven, you'd be more humanitarian than any of us are today because you are being preventative. So you remember Mia. Um, the last time I saw Mia was in a refugee camp. Mia was focused. She um, had this metal spoon, and she was digging, I think, um, a trench. And I was wondering what she was doing. I said, Mia, what are you making? And she said, I'm creating a safe space so that if my ants are attacked, they can have a safe place to hide. They can hide in the ditch. So I looked down closely, and sure enough, there is a line of ants. But it was what she said next. I, I will never forget. She said, and I want to show them the way so they know how to get back home. Her instinctive desire to protect even the insects, it's proof of her precious humanity. I know that through a hand up, with her kind of resilient, kind human spirit, she will lift her entire community up right along with her. So let's get to them before it's too late. The data tells us that it's a pragmatic thing to do. And we know, we know that this is the right thing to do. Thank you.